Hey, this is Frank Hannon. I'm the lead guitarist of Tesla, and you're listening to Focus on Metal. Hey, Metalhead, Scott Thompson here, and holy shit, yes, two weeks in a row, episodes back-to-back, can you fucking believe it? It's almost like a Christmas miracle. Yep, can you believe it? A genuine focus on metal Christmas miracle. So this week's one of those pop-up deals where uh, we're supporting one of our favorite artists, that would be Tesla, and everybody in that band is pretty damn awesome, but uh, Frank Hannon is putting out a brand new single. Uh, He says it's coming out on December 6th. It's called Fool's Delight, and he's trying to get the word out about this, and so, uh, hey, we're part of getting the word out. So Richie hit me up the other day, said, hey, I just did an interview with Frank, Uh, I dropped that in for you. And uh, just kind of let that roll. So it's like, okay, well, crap, got to get the studio fired up and get another episode out ASAP so we can uh, so we can support our buddy Frank. Last time we had Frank on, it's been a while, uh, episode 433 back in uh, 2019, believe it or not. We had Frank on talking about all things Tesla as well as uh, all things happening in uh, Frank Hannon solo land. So here we are again in episode 578. And another little bit of uh, talk with Frank, like last week, it's a short and sweet interview, Uh, 20-some-odd minutes, mostly talking about stuff going on with Tesla and just some of Frank's past history and all that. It's a really good talk. Frank is always pretty good. He is definitely a talker. And, uh, you know, the one thing that I really get out of this uh, interview is I was editing it up, and, and actually, Richie got it too, just as the whole thing of how excited Frank is still to this day about music, and when you early stuff, when he starts talking about seeing Aerosmith, Texas Jam, and all that, the guy sounds just as excited now as he probably was all that time ago. So, great guest. Uh, Again, be on the lookout. Fool's Delight. There'll be the single coming out as well as a video. You might actually have the video teaser up now. So check that out. And then also the tail end of this, Frank talks about why he put the single out now, what it's for. And he does talk about appearing with the Almond Betts Family Revival. A few dates in Florida coming up uh, the week of December 10th. So go to the end of the episode. You'll hear that. If you're down in Florida, you want to check out Frank with that band, uh, you know, go ahead and go for that as well. But with all of that out of the way, Juan and I shut the hell up and turn it over to Richie and Frank Hannon of Tesla. Hi, is that Frank? Yes, is this Richie? Yeah, Frank, how you doing? I'm fantastic, man. You know, I'm I'm hanging tough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm rolling. I'm rolling with it. Okay, excellent. Well, I've interviewed you once before, so I'm looking forward to talking to you again. Sounds good. The first question I want to ask you is about... Um, a guy that I got pretty fr- friendly with who used to contribute to the, sh- the show a little bit and it's a guy called Steve Herta, um, photographer. Um, he, he did a lot of uh, photos of, of Tesla and he, he passed away, I believe, from COVID. Um, how well did you know Steve? Well, you know, Steve was one of the biggest supporters of music in the Chicago area. And every time that I would go through Chicago, um, he was always there supporting us. And I didn't know him that well as a personal friend. Like, you know, I, I didn't go spend Christmas holidays with him at his house or anything. <laughs> yeah. But I knew him well enough to know that the guy really loved music. And he was an amazing photographer. And, you know, photography is weird when it comes to artists. You know, you can have the greatest photographer in the world, but if the chemistry isn't right with the artist, they don't really capture it. And then I've had fans with their cell phones capture me personally uh the essence of my life performance perfectly and steve herta was definitely one of those guys who had the knack and 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 the passion for for me not i don't mean to say just me but tesla obviously 
but me because for some reason he and I clicked when I was in a band called Moondog Main uh, during the dark times in the 90s when Tesla was broke up. Uh, he interviewed me and photographed me back then and became a friend. Um, so yeah, I miss Steve, man. It's real sad. You know, I watched him uh, with his health go downhill, but he would still always manage to get in the photo pit in the front row. And he created a book, uh, a Frank Hannon photo book that he gave me for Christmas that had all of his photos. And it's one of my uh, cherished possessions from the old from the old friend. I, I, I'm sad that he's gone. Mm. He actually told me about that, and uh, you know that he he said you were looking at some of the pictures and you were amazed, You're like wow, I I don't remember this at all. And you know you were gushing about some of the photos that he took. Yeah, you know it was surprising how when I when I looked back at Steve's work, you know, and it wasn't just me, man. It was Judas Priest. It was a lot of you know Tesla, obviously, and a lot of other artists that he was uh, uh, passionate about. Um, you know, so it's 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 another one of our um, allies has gone to rock and roll heaven, man. You know, it's 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 a it's I'll miss the guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but yeah, he was there. You know, I, when I talk about the '90s, uh, mid '90s were really dark days for Tesla. We were broken up. We had imploded. Uh, you know, there was a quote that quoted me in Blabbermouth or what? Just one of these gossip uh, sites that said that I said that grunge didn't affect Tesla, and grunge really didn't affect Tesla. It was our own internal dark problems that caused us to implode in the 90s but Steve was there among, uh, along with a lot of other loyal fans Eddie Lance uh, was another guy that was really encouraging and ultimately Pat Martin uh, from 98 Rock our local DJ got us back together in 2000 uh, but the 90s were some dark times and Steve had some great photos from that era which mm. uh, surprised me yeah yeah um, I want to talk about the uh the Aerosmith cover you did on the Full Throttle Live record SOS Too Bad and you said in interviews that you got the, the whole band together to play in the room um, and that when I when I read that I remember something that uh, Mike Fraser told me the the engineer who you, I'm sure you're aware of who he is um, mm-hmm. he, he told me that every band wants to do that but not all the bands are able to do that um, when you did that on the early records, because that's what you alluded to as well in interviews, um, did the producers say, no, no, you're not good enough to do it, or did they try it out and then they figured, wow, these guys can actually do it? Well, the producers that produced our first four albums, Mechanical Resonance, Radio Controversy, Psychotic Supper, you know, uh, the, the first three studio albums, I should say, re- anyway, um, Steve Thompson and Michael Barbiero, along with Tom Zutat, uh, they encouraged us to keep it as live as possible. And that was why we went to Bearsville Studio in upstate New York, is because it was designed as a big room with the ability for the band to jam in a big room together. And so that was never in, uh, a question back then. We wanted to capture a live take. Um, we had done de- numerous demos up to the making of our first album, and we had done it different ways with click tracks and you know punching in and overdubbing and replacing everything. And it it never all, it never sounded as good as what our first record does. It sounds the way it does because we were live in the studio. Mm. Uh, the reason bands can't do it now well I mean COVID obviously definitely put it when that was a an issue um, but the reason bands do it the other way now is it's more you know cost effective when Pro Tools and the computers and the internet and email and file sharing became so readily available the band's You know, artists don't have to be in the same room now. They can just email each other a song and add parts to it. And that's fun. Don't get me wrong. I've done plenty of sessions like that. Uh, But nothing compares to the magic of a band jamming in a room and capturing a live take. Mm. Um, When was the first time you saw Aerosmith live? Uh, 
Well, I can tell you, I saw them in my head, in my imagination, in, in the seventies, uh, with my headphones on and staring at the live bootleg album Skinner Sleeve. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, and in the seventies, it was different, man. We didn't have YouTube, and there was no MTV. There was, you know, you were lucky if you saw Aerosmith or a band like that ever, even on TV. I saw them live on TV, Cal Jam 78 uh, was a, a television program that came on at midnight, and it had Frank Marino, Mahogany Rush, Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, all performing live from the Cal Jam Festival, and that, you know, as a kid, I was 12 years old, I loved that TV show that came on, and uh, but seeing them live, actually live, first time was Texas Jam. Uh, 87 when Tesla opened for them at the Dallas Texas Cotton Bowl in 1987 was that with uh, White Snake on Poison Poison White Snake Aerosmith and Boston wow. and Boston yeah and it had Brad Delp was still alive and oh my gosh that's probably the biggest highlight show of my entire career would you, be that one you, you know what's great Frank about that you were, you were able to stay and watch the rest of the bands because I've spoken to numerous musicians and they'll say I had to go after I finished and we had to be somewhere else for another show so you actually got to sit there and watch all the rest of the acts oh yeah yeah I remember um, sitting on the side of the stage when Aerosmith was singing Ragdoll and that's why when that, that album first came out I think it was Permanent Vacation or Done With Mirrors or I can't remember it was when they first made their comeback yeah, and I remember being on the side of the stage and they were singing that song Ragdoll which I loved because I love ragtime music and the flavor of that song has like a ragtime blues flavor to it and Joe Perry was playing that slide and it was 120 felt like 120 degrees anyway <laughs> and they had fire hoses and they were spraying the audience with these fire hoses man and it was just so magical but even like what you're saying, better than that, uh, Richie, is the day before we got there, we got there a day early and they were sound checking in Boston and Aerosmith and everybody was doing sound check. And uh, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask you, Frank, about the residency you just did in, in Vegas. Um, I'm sure one of the challenges for that is, is the set list. Are, are you the catalyst for the set list? Saying, "All right, this is the songs that I think we should do," or is it a, is it a, is it a group effort? Well, I would say I don't know what the word catalyst. Uh, like, I'm not do, sure. Do you do, do you suggest the songs, and then oh, post yeah. them there, or is it the, the other people suggest songs? Like, would Steve Brown come in and say, no, "Look, I'd love to do this song with you"? Oh, sure. Yeah. No, we listen to Steve, Dave, our crew, the fans. We listen. You know, I look at the comments. Um, I'm the guy that kind of, I'm not really a catalyst. I'd say I'm the instigator. Okay. <laughs> I try to instigate songs, but it's a group effort. It's Tesla's always a group effort. And to be honest with you, it hinges on Jeff Keith, the singer. It always hinges on the singer. You know, what he's able to sing, what he's feeling like he can pull off, what he can't. And at this point in our career, you know, we, we just pick the songs that are, we know we can do that aren't going to hurt his voice and uh, get us through another month of shows, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're kind of limited in a sense, but we've rewritten some of the songs in different keys and we, we experiment uh, at sound checks to test the grounds on some of those old songs and see what we can do. Mm. Are there any songs in the Tesla catalog that you just, you personally, you don't really want to do live anymore? You don't care uh, for them, you know. You don't have an attachment to them anymore. You did, you know. You might have liked them when you did them, but you're like, nah, I'm not really feeling that one now. Well, there's songs that we have to play every night that I feel that way. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's a no. The, I'm not that way. Actually, there's a lot of songs I wish we could do. You know, there's yeah. a lot of songs from the old days that I would love to do. Um, so, no, me personally. Um, I'm not uh, that way. There's songs that I would like to to uh, try to do. Mm. Uh, yeah. But again, it comes back down to Jeff Keith and, and 
what he wants to do or what he can do. And, um, you know, he's definitely open-minded to trying things. But, uh, no, there's a lot of, I have a lot of favorites from the old days and a lot of favorites from the new, you know, there's different chapters of Tesla, you know, that I, you know, we've been, this is, we're pushing 40 years now and there's three chapters of, of the band. Yeah. So, you know, the, the newer stuff, uh, you know, the latest stuff, time to rock, yeah. old blue steel, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm real happy and proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't believe, Frank, that as part of the residency, you did a full acoustic set. Was that something that you toyed with doing? We leaned on a Tesla uh, acoustic night on Wednesday night of the first residency. Okay. Uh, um, but, yeah, we don't want to do a full, just full-on unplugged acoustic set at this time. We kind of got tired of doing that. We do incorporate it in the middle of the show. But... Uh, you know, maybe someday we'll do just an all-night full acoustic, but at this point where we're at now, uh, we're, we'll just throw a couple of acoustic numbers to pay tribute to that album. Um, what we try to do is pay tribute to, to the albums, you know, two or three songs from each period of time yeah. in a 90-minute set. You know, it's 90 minutes, and you got to put 35 years in that. Mm. Um. I want to ask you about Steve Brown, the person, because uh, I've interviewed his brother Mick years ago, and I couldn't get a word in. The guy just talked and talked and talked and talked. And I, I want to know, is Steve like that, like a gregarious up party, kind of always in a good mood guy? Is he the same as Mick? Yeah, those two guys are uh, cut from the same cloth. Uh, <laughs> yeah, got that real um, upbeat uh, personality. You know, I think I think there might be some Italian blood in there or something. I don't know. They have that, you know, real uh, upbeat personality. Okay, okay. Uh, do you still keep in, in contact with Troy? Well, you know, unfortunately, at this particular time, we haven't spoken uh, since he left the group. Um, and you know, I get sad about that, but I know eventually we're going to talk because you know, we Troy and I, me personally, have always had a great friendship and uh but right now we're just kind of taking a little break from each other you know i think uh it's a healthy break yeah yeah i want to ask about managing the band frank because i know you and and brian have a hand in that um how steep a learning curve was that in the beginning uh you know let's see this was about 15 years ago you know where we had to take over in a in a in a desperate need because the manager we had left suddenly and you know brian has always been real aggressive on the business side of things even when we were kids uh you know brian was older than me he was 18 i was 15 and he would go out to the clubs or the gigs places and get the gigs you know mm -hmm. and then i would be jamming in the garage making the recordings and then the, the, he would take those demos cassette tapes to the club owners to try to get the gigs so that dynamic between brian and me has remained the same pretty much uh to this day uh when we took over the management part of it my role was more on the creating the graphics for the t-shirts and and at that time I was doing the website stuff so there really wasn't a learning curve really because we were doing it from day one anyway yeah yeah uh, you know and after being through so many ups and downs in this business and dealing with so many freaking crazy circumstances you know we kind of figured out how to handle it pretty quickly is it is it difficult to you know you've got the band member hat on and the manager's hat on and sometimes you you have to think you can't think like what the band member wants you have to think like what the manager wants do you understand what i'm saying um it, it can that be difficult sometimes when it comes to deciding something that you might go with your heart and say yeah i'd love to do that but then your head would be going as the manager actually that's not a good idea well, it sounds like you have a good insight on uh, on that. And, uh, <laughs> very difficult. 
you know, if this was not difficult, then everybody would do it and succeed. It is a very difficult thing to have a machine, a band, a business, and to have longevity in it, much less to just have five years of success, have a hit, have a hit song. Coordinating people, getting all of the crew, the bus, everything all together, it's very difficult. And uh, artistically, yeah, you want to do something, but it may not be the right thing. And, you know, Brian has been always, has always been very good at, uh, at seeing the big picture of things. And uh, it's, it's not easy. The, the, it's doing what we do is definitely difficult to maintain it and mm. continue on. And there's like, I can give you just a rundown right now. Coordinating crew members, keeping the coordinating rehearsals, coordinating things alone. Just that word coordinating is very difficult. Um, have you ever reached out to Peter Mensch or Cliff Bernstein like in the last 15 years or so and asked for their advice? Is that avenue still open for you? Oh yeah, they're buddies, man. I know Brian talks to Peter and uh, I'm sure that if I made a call to Cliff, you know, he would take my call. During those dark times that I told you about in the 90s uh, when Tesla had our first uh, time apart, you know, I called Cliff and asked him for some help and he helped me tremendously. I Moondog Maine had some dates opening for Def Leppard. I mean, yeah, they're, they're, those guys are freaking awesome and have always been uh, uh, good dudes, man. Mm. Nothing but love and respect for Cliff and Peter. Okay. I just got a couple of questions left, Frank, and I'll leave you go. Um what what in your opinion is the underrated Tesla record? Oh uh, well, I think Into the Now was a, a great comeback record for us. Um, I think uh, Forevermore is a great underrated record, and you know, I mean, I don't know if the first records count as far as being underrated because everyone loves those, but. My favorite Tesla record will always be our first album. I mean, you know, I was young when I made it, 17 years old, 18 years old, writing them songs and recording them. It's got a very dear spot in my heart. Mm. Um, I'm a big fan of Terry Thomas um, with the work he did with your you guys and Bad Company and Foreigner. Um, I want to know, what did you learn specifically from him? And, you know, yeah, let's not forget Bust a Nut. And for, he did Forevermore as well, yeah. Terry Tom. Yeah. Oh, uh, man, bless his heart. Terry, you know, Terry came into the picture with Tesla when we were already kind of had developed some attitude problems, <laughs> drug problems, you know, and he had to really piece it together. He had the patience of a, of a, of a saint, Terry did. And... As far as an engineer goes and a songwriter, he's very talented. And, uh, you know, he was able to create space in the music and with guitar tones and the, the sound of the guitars uh, that I hadn't experienced before. I learned a lot from him about that, about how to create space in the music. And, uh, yeah, I love Terry. What a sweetheart. Was he a musician? Like, would he put on the guitar and come into the studio and say, this is what I'm trying to get from you? Yes, yeah. Yeah, he, and, you know, and he was a musician, and he was really great at working with Jeff Keith and and getting him comfortable uh, at getting a vocal track. But, yeah, Terry Thomas, I believe, was in a band called Charlie. Okay. And, um, yeah, great guitar player. Hmm. Um, Frank, so just tell me a little bit about th your new single, A Fool's Delight. It's an acoustic track. I've heard it. It's it, it's it's really good. Hey, thanks, man. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it's uh, it's an older song that uh, I wrote and recorded a few years ago, and my wife loves it. And she's like, "Why don't you release that song, Fool's Delight? It's such a fun song." And honestly, I love the song too. It's it's one of the easiest songs that I've ever written, as far as all the lyrics and the guitar picking and that chords and the feeling of it just came to me really fast one one day i was just goofing around and it i you know it flowed out of me so sometimes the best songs are like that they just flow out really quick but then again i recorded it 
and then just have been sitting on it for a long time. Um, Frank, last question. Have, have you ever woken up with a full song already in your head? Once in a while. Once in a while. And like I said, Fool's Delight is one of those. Yeah. Um, Sweet Southern Sound is another one uh, of those that's on my uh, album, Gypsy Highway. Mm -hmm. um, for Tesla, um, there's a song called Heaven 911. Yep. The, the the whole song came to me uh, pretty instantaneously, and it's one of the few songs that Jeff Keith actually sang my lyrics for. Um, so uh, yeah, it, once in a while it happens, you know. And you wish you could. But, uh, you wish you could bottle that, couldn't you? You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Tom, Petty, Tom Petty said, you know, you that's part of being a songwriter, and, and the skill that you have to learn is recognizing when you're receiving those ideas because they come from outer space you don't know they just automatically come to you and you have to be able to recognize when that's happening and then you have to record it or write it down or do whatever you got to do to to remember it so what what's in store for tesla next year i know you've got shows already announced um you going to write any new material we have some new song ideas uh, that that uh, we've been chipping away on. Uh, we have this beautiful ballad. It's called All About Love. We had talked about recording it, but um, I'm not sure what we're doing with Tesla. But I do want to talk about the fact that with Fool's Delight, my new single, it's coming out next week, mm -hmm. uh, December 6th, along with the video. The other reason I chose to release that now is because the flavor of that feel of my one of the sides of my style is real similar to Southern Rock and, you know, Allman Brothers. And I'm going to be doing shows with the Allman Betts Family Revival uh, in Florida. Nice. December 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, that time frame. Jacksonville, Florida, Sarasota, Florida, and Fort Pierce, uh, Florida, uh, coming up here just real soon. So I'll be doing shows with them. And uh, I wanted to put out this song at that time because, to me, the flavor of that vibe is is one of the the styles that I love tremendously. Is good old fashioned rock and roll, bluesy Southern rock feel. Mm. Frank, you know what's great about talking to you? You still have the uh, enthusiasm for playing live and writing songs. And there's a lot of artists that have had a forty year career and. You know, they've really no interest in writing anything new or they see it as a bit of a chore. And I don't get that from you at all. I'm still loco, mucho loco. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that means? No, Freaking, tell me. Uh, crazy, crazy about it. <laughs> I love music and, and I appreciate you, man. I appreciate guys that are willing to talk to us, crazy uh, musicians that want to keep doing it. I hope I didn't give you the Mick Brown treatment and talk too much. No. The, the, yeah, well, I haven't been too uh, <laughs> <laughs> been kind of talking to you, my friend. Maybe it's the three cups of coffee. I've had. <laughs> All right, Frank, I'm going to leave you go. It's always been a pleasure. It's a great pleasure, man. Thank you very much for having me. All right, and I'll see you out there. Okay, bye-bye. All right, bye. All right, there you go. Like I said, short and sweet. Frank is always awesome to talk to. Absolutely love guests like this. And again, be on the lookout uh, coming up December 6th for the release of Fool's Delight and the video that accompanies that as well. So that should be very cool. Acoustic track, like Frank mentioned. But uh, hey, it's it's Frank Hannon, right? You got to love the stuff that the guy does. And also, when you think about trying to catch things and who knows how many tickets are even left, Got to tell you, if you haven't ever gone out to see Trans-Siberian Orchestra, you got to go see them. It's almost a yearly deal for uh, for me, my girlfriend. This year, we brought her daughter and one of her daughter's friends. They freaking loved it. Great stuff. And I got to say, the East Coast Band with, uh, with Chris and Joel, they are absolutely kicking ass out there. Jeff Plate, awesome on the drums. Another killer show this year. Caught them out in Worcester. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter, you see some of the uh, some of the photos that uh, I posted on that. I don't take the photos. I actually have my girlfriend who does that and uh, takes a lot of the photos for Focus on Metal for me. So uh, kudos to her for doing that. I can sit back, watch the show. She takes care of all that. But great stuff. If you haven't caught TSO and there's still tickets available and they're coming near you, then uh, get off your ass, get some tickets, go out and see them. Well worth going to that show. 
And just one other, to me anyways, really important heads up before I get the hell out of here for the week. And that is, I got to tell you that uh, if you collect vinyl and you know good vinyl from bad vinyl, that uh, and you know all that good stuff, then you know about mobile fidelity. And uh, this week, they did announce that they are doing releases of most of the early Van Halen stuff. And it's on two discs. And if you know anything, like I said, about Mobile Fidelity, you know about the Single Master, you know about Super Vinyl. This may be one of the best Van Halen's releases you can buy on vinyl. So I would urge you, if you're really into Van Halen and you really want to have something where Based on the process they do, you're going to hear more musical information off the vinyl than you ever have before. Then uh, I would head up to MoFi, M-O-F-I dot com and check that out. As of right now, the day I am mixing this episode, the uh, Van Halen 1 is released. It is available for sale because of their process. It's a very low number of these that they press. I think it's a thousand. So, uh, Again, not cheap, but uh, if you want to hear probably one of the ultimate ways of having Van Halen on vinyl, this is the way to go, Mobile Fidelity. No, they're not sponsoring me. They're not paying me. None of that crap at all. Uh, I actually bought the Van Halen one myself as well. I wasn't missing this, and they have the other ones all queued up as well. So check that out again. It's mofi.com. I think you'll be really happy with all that stuff. All the mobile fidelity stuff, it flies off the shelf because vinyl enthusiasts know that they are that good and they don't do tons of releases every year either. So uh, if you have the money and it's something you think you'd want to do, go check that out. So uh, one last bit here is that uh, there's a potential, it's kind of like what they say, we're in talks that uh, you may actually hear some episodes coming up that will uh, feature a past host of Focus on Metal that you haven't heard for years. I didn't even do the calculation to figure out how many years, but uh, it's possible that uh, we may be doing some discussions once again with a uh, past host. Now, that doesn't mean that Richie's going anywhere. Of course not. I mean, me and Richie have been doing this thing for freaking forever. And, uh, you know, Richie's absolutely going nowhere. But, uh, you know, somebody else has come up and asked and said, hey, you know, I, I really would like to do some again. And I really miss doing them and all that good shit. And so we've been doing a lot of these discussion episodes. And it, it might actually be a good sync up to have somebody come back and uh, do some other discussion episodes as well. And maybe we'll get... Uh, a little more semi-regular. I mean, Richie, again, he's got a lot of stuff going on. He's very busy. I am too. Things have gotten sporadic, but uh, I may be able to carve out a little extra time to be able to mix, master, and do some discussions on a few things as well and get us into a more regular schedule. So we're going to see how it goes. Again, it's a tease. It's not set in stone yet, but uh, it looks like in the next week or so that... uh, may actually be having one of those happen, so we'll see. And if we do, that should be very cool. It means that, you know, along with myself, Richie, I always consider Brian Heaton out in the Pacific Northwest to be part of the show as well, that uh, we, you know, could have somebody else coming back into the stable as well. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But for this week, that's it. There ain't no more. Stick a fork in it. This puppy is done. So for Richie, myself, and everybody else here at Focus on Metal, have yourselves a great metal week. And until we talk to you again, as always, remember... Focus on Metal! Everything else is insignificant. You're still here? It's over. Go home.